Today let's talk about the eye. Before we go into the eye proper, let's take a look at some of the external features of the eye which are quite remarkable. Of course we have the palpebrae here which are the eyelids and then we have the lacrimal gland which is the tear producing gland. Tears actually travel across the surface of the eye and drain into small holes called puncta which in turn drain into small canals which we call lacrimal canals or canaliculi. And these in turn drain into what is referred to as the lacrimal sac, which will be over here in this region. And that in turn drains into the lacrimal canal. Sometimes it's referred to as the nasal lacrimal sac. Now, uh, let's take a look at the muscles that regulate the eye. And this particular one is the levator palpebrae superioris. This lifts the eyelid. So this is the one that helps you open your eyes wide. Another interesting feature is this little region here. This is referred to as the puncta. The puncta is a combination of sebaceous glands as well as sweat glands that help to keep the eye surface nice and moist. All right, I'm going to spin this and we're going to take a look at some of the extrinsic muscles of the eye. So we'll begin with the one that is right underneath the levator palpebrae superioris. This is referred to as the superior rectus muscle, and this helps you look up. So when your eyes are looking upward, this is the muscle that is in charge. Again, it is below the levator palpebrae superioris, even though it is called superior. It is superior compared to the rest of the extrinsic muscles of the eye. On this side, we have the lateral rectus muscle. And notice that it's next to the lacrimal gland. So the L's go together, lateral rectus, lacrimal gland. And of course, this helps move the eyes laterally. Let's remove some of these parts so we can see some of this other stuff clearer. And so underneath here is the inferior rectus muscle, and that helps move the eyes downward. Incidentally, the term rectus means straight. And then back here on the side, way back here, let's remove this so we can see that a little bit clearer. This is the medial rectus muscle, and that is the muscle that you use to cross your eyes. Now, in addition, we have two oblique muscles. This is the tendon of the superior oblique muscle. The superior oblique muscle runs through a little piece of cartilage called the trochlea, and actually the, muscle, the nerve that regulates this muscle is referred to as the trochlear nerve. What this muscle does is move the eyes downward. It rolls the eyes downward. So it does opposite of what we'd expect given the action of the superior rectus muscle. In addition, we have a muscle here in front, and this is also an oblique muscle. This is the inferior oblique muscle. This rolls the eyes upward. So O for opposite, O for oblique. Let's turn it just a little bit like this. Perhaps you can see that a little bit clearer. So this is, again, the inferior oblique muscle. Let's take a look at a different model. Now, this particular one comes apart, so I oftentimes refer to it as the eye puzzle. But before we take this apart, let's take a look at a review of some of these extrinsic muscles. Here's the lacrimal gland. And of course, this is the tear-producing gland. And as we know, the lacrimal gland is on the lateral side, and therefore, this is the lateral rectus muscle. This must be the superior rectus muscle, the uh, medial rectus muscle, and then, of course, down here would be the, let's see if we can tilt this just a little bit, this would be the inferior rectus muscle. On the side, this particular little muscle is representing the inferior oblique, whereas on top we have the tendon of the superior oblique muscle. Now notice the white of the eye, the sclera, and the clear portion of the eye, the cornea, are both referred to as the fibrous tunic. We take this apart here. We can also see uh, the iris, of course, which is part of the vascular tunic. And uh, of course, it is the pigmented muscle of the eye. Inside the iris is the little pupil. If I remove the iris right here, 
I can see the lens. The lens actually has no association with any tunic whatsoever. I'm going to remove the lens and the neural retina for now. And we're going to take a look at the internal region of the eye. So we already saw the iris as part of the vascular tunic. Behind the iris is the ciliary process. The ciliary process is responsible for making aqueous humor. In addition, we have something called the ciliary muscle. The ciliary muscle is responsible for the shape of the lens and helps in a process called accommodation. Likewise, we have a dark area here, this sort of brownish band, which represents the, corny, the choroid coat, the choroid coat. And this is, of course, the main area of the vasculature as well as an area that contains melanin that helps to absorb extra light at the eye. All right, let's go to the neural tunic. Now, right on top of the cornea, I'm sorry, right on top of the choroid is going to be a very thin piece of tissue made of simple cuboidal epithelium called the pigmented retina. Um, it's not represented well in this model, but I suppose we can think of this orange area as the pigmented retina. And of course, that's going to help maintain the biochemistry of the real retina of the eye, which we will see microscopically soon. So here's the retina of the eye. And the retina of the eye is actually pressed, essentially, onto the interior of the eye, partly by uh, the vitreous humor, which is a gelatin-like substance that we find within the eye, rich in proteoglycans and other materials that absorb water. We make this as embryos, and we never reproduce it. All right, let's go to another model. This model shows some nice vitreous humor once again, and you can see how the vitreous humor is really kind of slamming the neural retina onto the wall of the eye. So there's no direct attachment to the neural retina other than pressure. We can also take a look here at the ciliary muscles. And of course, there are little suspensory ligaments that are represented quite well in this model, which connect the ciliary muscles with the iris, with the, um, with the lens of the eye. And of course, there's the iris here, as well as the cornea. Another thing we see quite plainly on this model is this sort of purplish structure. And this, again, is the choroid, or the choroid coat. And likewise, we find the optic nerve coming out of the back of the eye. All right, let's take a look at this microscopically. Now let's view the microscopic eye. Let's begin with the cornea. Remember, this is the place where light rays are going to travel through, and they will refract. They'll actually bend on their way to the lens. This is the lens right here. You can appreciate this is the iris, so this would be a very large pupil. And this, of course, is the anterior cavity posterior cavity of the eye is back in this region here, and of course this would be containing vitreous humor. We also see some ciliary muscles here as well as some suspensory ligaments. Here's a closer view of the cornea, and of course the iris is right behind it, and we can view some of the suspensory ligaments as well. This is the ciliary process the region where aqueous humor is made. And of course, we can see smooth muscle here, which is part of the ciliary muscle that helps to produce uh, shape, or actually helps create shape for the lens. The ciliary process and the ciliary muscle combined are sometimes referred to as the ciliary body. So imagine that the, um, the ciliary body embodies both the ciliary process, and the ciliary muscle. Now here's my favorite part of the eye. This is the retina, and of course this is the neural retina that we're looking at, at least the bulk of it. So this, the light is actually going to be traveling down this way through the first layer, which is the ganglion cell layer. Notice very few cells here, and incidentally, 
So this is the ganglion. So light is traveling through here, and the very first layer it passes through is the ganglion cell layer. The ganglion cell layer has very, very few cells, and these, the axons of these cells actually make the optic nerve. Associated with the ganglion cells is a layer of bipolar cells, which are in direct communication with the photoreceptor cells. The photoreceptor cells contain both rods and cones. And perhaps you can see these darker cells here. These are the cones. Now in a region of the eye called the fovea centralis, all these layers basically part away, exposing only the area of the photoreceptor cells. So we have in, those, in that particular layer, we have nothing but cones. And again, that is referred to as the fovea centralis. The rest of the eye pretty much looks like this in terms of the neural retina. Below the neural retina is this layer of simple cuboidal epithelial cells. And this, of course, has pigment. This is the pigmented retina. And once again, this is going to help to maintain the biochemistry of the photoreceptor layer. Below the pigmented retina is the choroid. Again, this is an area rich in blood vessels as well as pigment. And below that is the white of the eye called the sclera. Well, that about wraps it up.